Hey guys, we're gonna try another little experiment today. And based on the way my last thought experiment was received so poorly, uh, I gotta be crazy for doing this, but I don't just do topics on this YouTube channel to be well received. I'm not doing this to be popular. I'm doing this because I really believe in the quote on the screen right now. In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And I am a huge fan of George Orwell. I reference him all the time. I think he's one of the most uniquely brilliant thinkers ever. And the thing I feel distinguishes Orwell from most um, philosophers, I'll say modern, but by modern, I mean uh, going back to, you know, industrial age sort of thing. Um, uh, the, the thing that strikes me about Orwell is he was uniquely and savagely aware of his own failings as both a human being and an intellectual. And he included his examination of those failings in his work. Uh, any thinking person, anybody who wants to essentially think for a living, has to be acutely aware when they start that they don't have all the answers. They're contributing the best they can at this point in history, knowing they don't know it all, but the hope is that you, you know, you contribute and then people take a look at what you've done and take the best parts of your argument and move forward and use it in theirs. That's all you can hope for. And the other thing I, li I really like about Orwell is he uses introspection phenomenally well. He's clearly well read and uses statistics and uses citations and all that stuff. But then he, he, he steps inward and self-examines and uses his own experiences and his own thinking and his own flawed thinking in his work. And I try to emulate that. And that's what led to the last absolute disaster in terms of reception of a thought experience. But I do believe in telling the truth, even when it's hard, even when it's unpopular, even when you're not sure you're right. The only way you learn, the only way you evolve your positions is saying something and being challenged. And by that, I don't mean sworn at and told you're a terrible human being, but being presented with a counter argument and every so often you hit a point, go, huh, that's something I hadn't considered. That's something I did not know. And you learn things that way. And I have learned a great deal over the last few days just by talking to people and sharing opinions and not agreeing on everything, but having a, a free and open exchange of ideas without personal attacks. I've learned a lot about the socioeconomic situation in Germany over the last few days because of the horrible, terrible attacks on women in Cologne, Germany uh, on New Year's Eve. And... Of course, it's very hard to have a conversation on social media without, you know, as, as some people call it, the sea lions showing up and, and complaining that something or other, some comment you made 140 characters uh, at a time out of context is egregiously stupid. And the next thing you know, you have six people yelling at you and ruining the conversation. So I turned inward and I started going back to um, classic works of thinking, I started reading some Aristotle, started reading some Immanuel Kant, started reading some Schopenhauer, some, um, uh, I, I, I can't get through Marx. Um, I, I, I would not be good as a Marxist. I find Marx's, well, at least the translation of Marx's stuff. So, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Cold and bland. The, the way Marx lays out his thoughts is just so bleh. And it's not a necessity. It's, it's not, you know, an, a natural offshoot of, you know, writing in, in a Germanic language. I love, uh, Kafka. So Marx is just bleh to me on, on a, on an aesthetic level ideas aside. But um, I do enjoy Bernard Shaw, which borrowed a lot of socialist, you know, back then communist ideas. And, uh, you know, I, I don't agree with anyone's source 100%. You shouldn't. You should never worship someone slavishly. You should always question.
but I kept coming back to Orwell. And so I did something that I think is, is a shining example of why Orwell is still relevant, but also a real uh, caution against believing that we live in this progressive time and that we are in a, a post bigotry world. I mean, when Obama got elected, there was a lot of talk about a post-racial America, which of course absolutely turned out not to be true. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk in certain circles about a post-feminist developed world. And, you know, time again, we see attacks on, on women's reproductive freedoms and things like that, that, that just show that idea that we, we don't need some sort of, um, persistent advocacy for women's right to self-determination and, and, and women's right to true equality and agency. Um, th there's this idea that it's unnecessary and, and that that's just not backed up by, by the facts. And don't get me wrong. I don't think we can eliminate bad thoughts. The, the issues with these things is that they're ending up in government systems, not in a meaningful way. And, and we'll, we'll get to that, but they are ending up there. And, you know, with, without constant vigilance, to, to quote a Harry Potter character, it, it can become meaningful very quickly. So I did an experiment. I took this essay by George Orwell, written in 1945. Um, and, and, you know, for those of you that, that noticed 1945, obviously, you know, anti-Semitism in Britain was, was written with stark awareness of the Holocaust and the atrocities committed against uh, Jewish people in, in Germany. And I've changed some, I've done some find replace with this brilliant article. And I will include the link to this so you guys can go back and read the original in part so you can compare, see that I really only changed words and names to make it relevant and change the dates and locations to stuff that um, uh, is more applicable today. But the, the guts of it, the thinking, has not changed from 1945 to 2015. There are about 44 million known Muslims in Europe, and in addition, some hundreds of thousands or at most millions of Muslim refugees who have entered the country from 2015 onwards. The Muslim population is almost entirely concentrated in half a dozen big towns and is mostly employed in the food, clothing, and furniture trades. A few of the big monopolies, such as the ICI, one or two leading newspapers, and at least one big chain of department stores are Muslim-owned or partly Muslim-owned. But it would be very far from the truth to say that British business life is dominated by Muslims. The Muslims seem, on the contrary, to have failed to keep up with the modern tendency towards big amalgamations and to have remained fixed in those trades which are necessarily carried out on a small scale and by old-fashioned methods. I start off with these background facts, which are already known to any well-informed person, in order to emphasize that there is no real Muslim problem in Europe. The Muslims are not numerous or powerful enough, and it is only in what are loosely called intellectual circles that they have any noticeable influence. Yet it is generally admitted that Islamophobia is on the increase, that it has been greatly exacerbated by the war, and that humane and enlightened people are not immune to it. It does not take violent forms. European people are almost invariably gentle and law-abiding, but it is ill-natured enough, and in favorable circumstances it could have political results. Here are some samples of Islamophobic remarks that have been made to me during the past year or two. Middle-aged office employee. I generally come to work by bus. It takes longer, but I don't care about using the underground from Golders Greer nowadays. There's too many of the followers of the prophet traveling that line. Tobacconist woman. And this was one of the things I didn't update because this was tough. No, I've got no matches for you, but you should try the lady down the street. She's always got matches. One of the followers of the prophet, you see. Young intellectual, communist, intellectual communist, or near communist. No, I do not like Muslims. I've never made any secret of that. I can't stick them. Mind you, I'm not Islamophobic, of course. Middle class woman. Well, no one would call me Islamophobic, but I do think the way these Muslims behave is absolutely stinking. The way they push their way to the head of queues and so on. The milk roundsman. 
A Muslim don't do no work. Not the same as what an Englishman does. He's too clever. We work with this here. Next. They work with that there. Taps his forehead. Chartered accountant. Intelligent, left wing in an undirected way. These bloody Muslims are all pro-caliphate. They change sides tomorrow if ISIS got here. I see a lot of them in my business. They admire ISIS at the bottom of their hearts. They'll always suck up to anyone who kicks them. Intelligent woman on being offered a book dealing with Islamophobia and ISIS atrocities against Shiite Muslims. Don't show it to me. Please don't show it to me. It'll only make me hate the Muslims more than ever. I could fill pages with similar remarks, but these will do to go on with. Two facts emerge from them. One, which is very important and which I must return to in a moment, is that above a certain intellectual level, people are ashamed of being Islamophobic and are careful to draw the distinction between Islamophobia and disliking Muslims. The other is that Islamophobia is an irrational thing. The Muslims accused of specific offenses, for instance, bad behavior and food cues, which the person speaking feels strongly about. But it is obvious that these accusations merely rationalize some deep-rooted prejudice. To attempt to counter them with facts and statistics is useless and may sometimes be worse than useless. As the last of the above-quoted remarks shows, people can remain Islamophobic, or at least anti-Muslim, while being fully aware that their outlook is indefensible. If you dislike somebody, you dislike him, and that is the, there is the end of it. Your feelings are not made any better by a recital of his virtues. It so happens that the war has encouraged the growth of Islamophobia and even in the eyes of many ordinary people, given some justification for it. To begin with, the Muslims are one people of whom it can be said with complete certainty that they will benefit by a coalition victory. Consequently, the theory that this is a Muslim war has a certain plausibility, all the more so because the Muslim war effort seldom gets its fair share of recognition. The United Nations is a huge heterogeneous organization held together largely by mutual consent and is often necessary to flatter the less reliable elements at the expense of the more loyal ones. To publicize the exploits of Muslim soldiers or even to admit the existence of a considerable Muslim resistance to ISIS in the Middle East rouses hostility in South Africa, the Arab countries, and elsewhere. It is easier to ignore the whole subject and allow the man in the street to go on thinking that Muslims are exceptionally clever at dodging military service. Then again, Muslims are to be found in exactly those trades which are bound to incur on popularity with the civilian public in wartime. Muslims are mostly concerned with selling food, clothes, furniture, and tobacco, exactly the commodities of which there's a chronic shortage with consequent overcharging, black marketing, and favoritism. And again, the common charge that Muslims behave in, a sexual, in an exceptionally cowardly way during air raids was given a certain amount of color by the big raids of 2015. As it happens, certain quarters of Syria were the first areas to be heavily blitzed, with the natural result that swarms of Muslim refugees distributed themselves all over Europe. If one judged merely from these wartime phenomenon, it would be easy to imagine that Islamophobia is a quasi-rational thing founded on mistaken premises. And naturally, the Islamophobe thinks of himself as a reasonable being. Whenever I've touched on in a newspaper article, I have always had considerable comeback, and invariably some of the letters are from well-balanced middling people. Doctors, for example, with no apparent economic grievance. These people always say, as Donald Trump says in speeches, that they started out with no anti-Muslim prejudice, but were given into their present position by mere observation of the facts. Yet one of the marks of Islamophobia is an ability to believe stories that could not possibly be true. One could see a good example of this in the strange accident that occurred in Paris in 2015. And I'll note here that this is an actual news story that occurred after the Paris bombings. I am not making light of the Paris bombings themselves. When a crowd frightened by a firework detonating nearby fled a bar with the result that an Australian TV host TV host was nearly crushed to death. The very same day it was repeated all over Paris that the Muslims were responsible. Clearly, if people will believe this kind of thing, one will not get much further by arguing with them. The only useful approach is to discover why they can swallow absurdities on one particular subject while remaining sane on others. But now let me come back to that point I mentioned earlier, that there is widespread awareness of the prevalence of Islamophobic feeling and unwillingness to admit sharing it. Among educated people, Islamophobia is held to be an unforgivable sin, 
and in quite a different category from other kinds of racial prejudice. People will go to remarkable lengths to demonstrate that they are not Islamophobic. Thus, in 2015, an intercession service on behalf of the Syrian refugees was held in a local mosque. The local authorities declared themselves anxious to participate in it, and the service was attended by the mayor of the borough in his robes and chain, by representatives of all the churches, and by detachments of RAF, home guards, nurses, boy scouts, and whatnot. On the surface, it was a touching demonstration of solidarity with the suffering Muslims. But it was essentially a conscious effort to behave decently by people whose subjective feelings must in many cases have been very different. That quarter of Michigan is partly Muslim. Islamophobia is rife there. And as I well knew, some of the men sitting around me in the mosque were tinged by it. Indeed, the commander of my own platoon of home guards, who had been especially keen beforehand that we should make a good show at the intercession service, was an ex-member of Donald Trump's campaign. While this division of feeling exists, tolerance of mass violence against Muslims or, what is more important, Islamophobic legislation are not possible in the West. It is not at present possible, indeed, that Islamophobia should become respectable. But this is less of an advantage than it might appear. One effect of the persecutions in the Middle East has been to prevent Islamophobia from being seriously studied. In England, a brief inadequate survey was made by mass observation a year or two ago. But if there has been any other investigation of the subject, then its findings have been kept strictly secret. At the same time, there has been conscious suppression by all thoughtful people of anything likely to wound Muslim susceptibilities. After 2015, the Muslim cartoons disappeared as though by magic from postcards, periodicals, the music hall stage, and to put an unsympathetic Muslim character into a novel or short story, became, came to be regarded as Islamophobia. On the Palestine issue, too, it was de rigueur among enlightened people to accept the Muslim cases proved and avoid examining the claims of the Israelis, a decision which might be correct on its own merits, but which was adopted primarily because the Muslims were in trouble and it was felt that one must not criticize them. Thanks to ISIS, therefore, you had a situation in which the press was in effect censored in favor of the Muslims, while in private Islamophobia was on the upgrade, even to some extent, among sensitive and intelligent people. This was particularly noticeable in 2006 at the time of the internment of the refugees. Naturally, every thinking person felt that it was his duty to protest against the wholesale locking up of unfortunate foreigners who were, for the most part, only in Europe because they were opponents of ISIS. Privately, however, one heard very different sentiments expressed. A minority of the refugees behaved in an exceedingly tactless way, and the feelings against them necessarily had an Islamophobic undercurrent, since they were largely Muslims. A very eminent figure in the Labour Party, I won't name him, but he's one of the most respected people in England, said to me quite violently, we never ask these people to come to this country. If they choose to come here, let them take the consequences. Yet this man would, as a matter of course, have associated himself with any kind of petition or manifesto against the internment of aliens. This feeling that Islamophobia is something sinful and disgraceful, something that a civilized person does not suffer from, is unfavorable to a scientific approach. And indeed, many people will admit that they are frightened of probing too deeply into the subject. They are frightened, that is to say, of discovering not only that Islamophobia is spreading, but that they themselves are infected by it. To see this in perspective, one must look back a few decades to the days when al-Baghdadi was a shy religious scholar whom nobody had heard of. One would then find that though Islamophobia is sufficiently in evidence now, it is probably less prevalent in the West than it was 30 years ago. It is true that Islamophobia as a fully thought out racial or religious doctrine has never flourished in the West. There has never been much feeling against intermarriage or against Muslims taking a prominent part in public life. Nevertheless, 30 years ago, it was accepted more or less as a law of nature that a Muslim was a figure of fun and, though superior intelligence, slightly deficient in character. In theory, a Muslim suffered from no legal disabilities, but in effect, he was debarred from certain professions. He would probably not have been accepted as an officer in the Navy, for instance, nor in what is called a smart regiment in the army. A Muslim boy at a public school almost invariably had a bad time. He could, of course, live down his Muslimness if he was exceptionally charming or athletic, but, but it was an initial disability comparable to a stammer or a birthmark. Wealthy Muslims tended to disguise themselves under aristocratic English or Scottish names. 
And to the average person, it seemed quite natural that they should do this, just as it seems natural for a criminal to change his identity if possible. About 20 years ago in Ankara, I was getting into a taxi with a friend when a small ragged boy of fair complexion rushed up to us and began a complicated story about having arrived from Damascus on a ship and wanting money to get back. His manner and appearance were difficult to place, and I said to him, You speak very good English. What nationality are you? He answered eagerly in his accent, I am Muslim, sir. And I remember turning to my companion and saying only partly in joke, He admits it openly. All the... All the Muslims I had known till then were people who were ashamed of being Muslims, or, at any rate, preferred not to talk about their ancestry, and if forced to do so, tended to use the word brown. The working class attitude was no better. The Muslim who grew up in Dearborn took it for granted that he would be assaulted, or at least hooted at, if he ventured into one of the Christian slums nearby. And the Muslim joke of the music halls and the comic papers was almost consistently ill-natured. There was also literary Muslim baiting, which in the hands of Hitchens, Marr, and their followers reached an almost continental level of scurrility. There has been a perceptible Islamophobic strain in English literature from Chaucer onwards, and without even getting up from this table to consult a book, I can think of passages which, if written now, would be stigmatized as Islamophobia. In the works of Shakespeare, Smollett, Thackeray, Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, T.S. Eliot, Aldous Huxley, and various others. Offhand, the only English writers I can think of who, before the days of ISIS, made a definite effort to stick up for Muslims are Salman Rushdie and Ben Affleck. That was a joke. And however little the average intellectual may have agreed with the opinions of Hitchens and Marr, he did not acutely disprove of them. Marr's endless tirades against Muslims, which he thrust into stories and essays upon the flimsiest pretext, never got him into trouble. Indeed, Marr was one of the most generally respected figures in English secular life. Anyone who began writing in that strain now would bring down a storm of abuse upon himself, or more probably would find it impossible to get his writings published. If, as I suggest, prejudice against Muslims has always been pretty widespread in Europe, there's no reason to think that ISIS has genuinely diminished it. It's merely caused a sharp division between the politically conscious person who realizes that this is not a time to throw stones at the Muslims and the unconscious person whose native Islamophobia is increased by the nervous strain of the war. One can assume, therefore, that many people who would perish rather than admit to Islamophobic feelings are secretly prone to them. I've already indicated that I believe Islamophobia to be essentially a neurosis, but of course it has its rationalizations, which are sincerely believed in and are partly true. The rationalization put forward by the common man is that the Muslim is an exploiter. The partial justification for this is that the Muslim in Europe is generally a small businessman. That is to say, a person whose depredations are more obvious and intelligible than those of, say, a bank or an insurance company. Higher up the intellectual scale, Islamophobia is rationalized by saying that the Muslim is a person who spreads disaffection and weakens national morale. Again, there is some superficial justification for this. During the past 25 years, the activities of what are called intellectuals have been largely mischievous. I do not think it an exaggeration to say that intellectuals had done their work a little more thoroughly. Assad would have surrendered in 2014, but the disaffected intelligentsia inevitably included a large number of Muslims. With some plausibility, it can be said that the Muslims are the enemies of our native culture and our national morale. Carefully examined, the claim is seen to be nonsense, but there are always a few prominent individuals who can be cited in support of it. During the past few years, there's been what amounts to a counterattack against the rather shallow leftism, which was favorable in the previous decade, and which was exemplified by such organizations as university campus safe spaces. I can't get through that without laughing. 1945, people! This counterattack, see for instance, the modern Republican Party, has an Islamophobic strain, and it would probably be more marked if the subject were not so obviously dangerous. It so happens that for some decades past, America has had no nationalist intelligentsia worth bothering about, but American nationalism, that is, nationalism of an intellectual kind, may revive, and probably will revive if America comes out of the present war greatly weakened. The young intellectuals of 2020 may be as naively patriotic as those of 1914. In that case, the kind of Islamophobia which flourished among the anti-refugee groups in Europe, and which Marr and Trump tried to import into this country, might get a foothold.
I have no hard and fast theory about the origins of Islamophobia. The two current explanations that it is due to economic causes, or on the other hand, that it is a legacy from the Middle Ages, seem to me unsatisfactory, although I admit that if one combines them, they can be made to cover the facts. All I would say with confidence is that Islamophobia is part of the larger problem of nationalism, which has not yet been seriously examined and that the Muslim is evidently a scapegoat. Though, for what he is a scapegoat, we do not yet know. In this essay, I have relied almost entirely on my own limited experience, and perhaps every one of my conclusions would be negatived by other observers. The fact is that there is almost no data on this subject. But for what they are worth, I will summarize my opinions. Boiled down, they amount to this. There is more Islamophobia in the West that we care to admit, and the war has accentuated it. But it is not certain that it is on the increase if one thinks in terms of decades rather than years. It does not at present lead to open persecution, but it has the effect of making people callous to the suffering of Muslims in other countries. It is at bottom quite irrational and will not yield to argument. The persecutions in the Middle East have caused much concealment of Islamophobic feelings and thus obscured the whole picture. The subject needs serious investigation. Only the last point is worth expanding. To study any subject scientifically, one needs a detached attitude, which is obviously harder when one's own interests or emotions are involved. Plenty of people who are quite capable of being objective about sea urchins, say, or the square root of two, become schizophrenic if they have to think about the sources of their own income. What vitiates nearly all that is written about Islamophobia is the assumption in the writer's mind that he himself is immune to it. Since I know that Islamophobia is irrational, he argues, it follows that I do not share it. He thus fails to start his investigation in the one place where he could get hold of some reliable evidence, that is, in his own mind. It seems to me a safe assumption that the disease loosely called nationalism is now almost universal. Islamophobia is only one manifestation of nationalism and not everyone will have the disease in that particular form. A Muslim, for example, would not be Islamophobic, but then many extremist Muslims seem to be merely Islamophobes term upside down, just as many Indians and African Americans display the normal color prejudices in an inverted form. The point is that something, some psychological vitamin is lacking in modern civilization and as a result, we are all more or less subject to this lunacy of believing that whole races or nations are mysteriously good or mysteriously evil. I defy any modern intellectual to look closely and honestly into his own mind without coming upon nationalistic loyalties and hatreds of one kind or another. It is the fact that we can feel the emotional tug of such things and yet see them dispassionately for what they are that gives him his status as an intellectual. It will be seen, therefore, that the starting point for any investigation of Islamophobia should not be why does this obviously irrational belief appeal to other people, but why does Islamophobia appeal to me? What is there about it that I feel to be true? If one asks this question, one at least discovers one's own rationalizations, and it may be possible to find out what lies beneath them. Islamophobia should be investigated, and I will not say by Islamophobes, but at any rate by people who know that they are not immune to that kind of emotion. When I when ISIS has disappeared, a real inquiry into this subject will be possible, and it would probably be best to start not by debunking Islamophobia, but by marshalling all the justifications for it that can be found in one's own mind or anybody else's. In that way, one might get some clues that would lead to its psychological roots. But that Islamophobia will be definitively cured without curing the larger disease of nationalism, I do not believe. There you go. Submitted for your approval, George Orwell's essay on anti-Semitism from 1945, just with anti-Semitism and Jews changed to Islamophobia and Muslims and some places and people updated, but the bulk of the text is essentially the same. Go ahead, read the original article with the original text, do with it what you will. I'm still mulling over my conclusions, if any there are to draw for this. But you got to admit, it's pretty interesting, yeah?